The Intruder. Cora Mayorellis, Story 1. By Christina Jotty Martins, this audiobook was created using artificial voices and talk to speech tools. Thank you for listening. Captain Jane Skye flung herself down a corridor of her ship which was so destroyed that it barely existed anymore. The emergency force field was her only protection against the cold and extremely radioactive space outside. The battle had finally reached a truce, but perhaps it was too late, she balanced herself as best she could and stubbornly thrust her boot through a broken piece of the wall to form a passage. The glow of the Heart of Gold Nebula assaulted her face, seeping through the tear that cut through several floors of her ship and drowned the fleet of debris around her in its macabre light, a mute threat. Jane took a breath and moved on. That was the most direct route to the hangar in the engine room, and she was more afraid of what she would find there than she was of death in the vacuum. What difference did it make, one more corpse lost in that forgotten piece of space, she quickened her pace and moved to a firmer patch of corridor, her sols bouncing off the unstable floor, which had been made uneven by the gunfire of a few minutes prior. The rhythm of her feet complemented frantic heartbeats, pulsing in her ears in a silent plea. Please be alive, please be alive, please be alive, the hangar doors opened to let her in. In the far corner of the room, the last combat ship of the space-bound colony lay shattered, its pieces still smoking in a bad omen. When whole, the Valiant would not fit in the compass's hangar, and instead, the two ships slid side by side like sisters, exchanging only resources and passengers with each other. What they had brought inside was only its human heart, the command room, where survivors would shelter in case of emergency, the rest was floating somewhere around the heart of gold. Jane's eyes scoured the carcass, but didn't find what they were looking for. Cursing, she damned time, space, and the Akka for taking her crew away. Her mechanics and engineers huddled among the medical droids, but like her, they were not interested in the ship. They kept looking. The captain rushed forward, clinging to some futile hope that her friend was still alive, the blood rushing in her ears and preventing her from listening to reason. Tam, her co-captain, held her firmly by the shoulders to prevent her from passing, the Valiant was his ship, but it hadn't been him in the captain's chair when the attack had occurred. Maybe if it had been. The cold, hard touch of Tam's metal arm sent a chill down Jane's spine, settling as dread in the pit of her stomach. She searched for solace in his expression, but he shook his head, wordlessly conveying that she wouldn't want to see what awaited them. There's organic debris scattered all around the command room, Jane, he said, his mournful tone conveying that organic debris meant there wasn't enough left for a corpse. Nobody made it. Jane choked down a sob. Eerie. The image of gray hair and a rectangular face framed by Jane's old glasses floated dear and familiar in her memory. She forced herself to push him to the back of her mind, even as grief sucker punched her. She couldn't afford to think about him right now. She straightened her dusty uniform. There would be time for morning later. They weren't safe yet, and the ship needed its captain. Leave him, she said, her voice steady, shaky hands pulling at her uniform in a solemn pose. Her crew got up slowly and stared at her glassily. The droids can handle the debris and, and the crewman. We have more pressing problems to attend to. All senior officers, gather at the command room. Becca, Greg, you two can fill me in as we walk. What is the engine status? Tam and Jane carved their way through the compass, imperiously defending each other from the wreckage. Corridors bent to their will as if they were a single entity when they worked together, or as if the pieces of wiring and wall were embarrassed before their presence and scurried to resume their stations. Greg and Becca, the two chiefs of machinery, followed them, not quite managing to maneuver themselves as gracefully through the destroyed hallways. The compass's engine is malfunctioning, and the valiance has completely failed, said Greg, adjusting his safety goggles on his forehead. Sweat dripped down his curly hair into his dust-caked face. He was fat and out of shape, and keeping up with Jane and Tam's rapid pace was making him incredibly breathless. Overlight travel is not functioning. We've lost the ability to glide during the last attack, and our underlight engine is at 60%. Becca, weapon status. Tam asked mid-curse word. Becca shook her mane of way too red hair in a way that made her head look like it was on fire, 
The heavy hitters are goners. All we've got left are weak short-range torpedoes. In between towing in the Valiant and maintaining the structural integrity of Compass's holy hull, we ended up letting something go. This time it was the ammo, she said bitterly, then added with a touch of sarcasm. Oh, but we've got some alert beacons, in case you guys would rather give away our position and die faster. So our fists aren't throwing any punches, mumbled Jane, a sardonic, humorless smile stretching across her face. Pity we've picked the fight already, remarked Tam. The command room already held three other members of the crew by the time the quartet forced their way through the malfunctioning doors. Trisha, the ship's pilot, studied some flight schematics and nodded her greeting without ever taking her red-rimmed, tired eyes from the task. Artemd, the medical android, didn't bother being physically present. His software stared ahead out of one of the computer consoles with an empty expression. And Jane knew he was likely saving his processing power for the remote droids still operating in the hangar and the infirmary. Morrow had simply been waiting for them, sitting on the tabletop. She jumped up from her spot, looking especially blue-skinned and alien-like by daring to have large, emotional eyes in a room where everyone had forced themselves into stoicism. The arriving group assumed their positions efficiently around the table. Morrow held Captain Jane's hand in hers for a moment the darker human skin and the cerulean alien tangling together briefly in a solidary squeeze. Jane nodded her gratitude, taking her hand back to straighten her uniform, she inhaled and regained her professional composure. Very well. We require a plan then. She started. Greg, Becca, what would we gain if we contracted the perimeter of the external shield and exposed the ship's non-essential areas? Greg hesitated, frozen by the implications. Becca, Natively from the space-bound colony and therefore more used to having to do the unthinkable during emergencies, was quicker to recover. We could get the underlight engine back to full capacity, she replied. That'd cost us three, maybe four labs on our left side and half of the crew's private rooms. There shouldn't be a whole lot of people out there to be evacuated right now, anyhow. What about overlight travel? inquired Tam. Without a shield, we would compromise our structural integrity even further, cautioned Greg. But possible, insisted Tam, in random, short bursts, Becca explained. We wouldn't be winning any races. Trisha. Trisha nodded. Give me paths that will conceal our trail as we journey towards Heart of Gold. Behind Jane's back, Greg made an involuntary squeak in the back of his throat, like a wounded dog. Becca elbowed him. We can follow this ion trail. The radiation from the nearest stars should be interference enough to conceal us, said Trisha tracing the path with a finger. But, Greg started. His protest died in his throat before it had a chance to form itself. How long is the journey? Jane asked. Around 40 minutes, Trisha estimated. 20 if we can use those short bursts of engine power better. Maro interrupted, running towards the door. I'll see what I can get out of the engine room. Jane nodded her consent. Wait a minute. Captain, captains, Greg exclaimed, correcting himself to include both Jane and Tam. Should we navigate into the heart of Gold Nebula, the exposed parts of the ship will be susceptible to heat damage. We will be left with a pile of molten metal in their place. Half of the crew's private rooms, you said. And three laboratories. Jane asked Becca. Or four. And both of y'all's quarters are included in this, Becca said, pointing at Jane and Tam. Well. Greg, given that the alternative is to remain in the open and succumb to certain death in combat, I am willing to take the risk, Jane conceded, putting her hand on Greg's shoulder. Though I may forfeit my possessions today, I refuse to surrender any more of my crew. Ensure the force fields penetrate the walls to minimize heat convection. Let us refrain from melting anything unnecessary. After we do that, will we have any unpleasant consequences besides the aesthetic? Well. The walls in some parts of the ship are too thin to handle atmospheric reentry without proper shielding. Greg pondered hesitantly. If someday we need to land, we will be in trouble. We'll worry about that when we get there, and, please, let's all hope we'll have to soon enough. Tam said, tipping his head. In the meantime, we could eject the compartments that would be melted and scatter them with the Valiant's debris. We'd give everyone out there a hand in believing that we're dead. If we're lucky, maybe we'll get to fish them back later and use the metal to toughen up our walls. 
How long can we stay in this nebula? Becca and Greg exchanged glances. A couple of hours? Becca asked. 10 to 12, perhaps. Greg estimated, counting the calculations on his fingers. After that, the radiation will gradually permeate the shields. It will not be enough to melt the ship, but it would lead to our premature deaths. Tam frowned. We'd better think of something before then, huh? Now would be a good time for a miracle. Jane muttered for Tam's ears only. He wrapped his metal arm around his friend's shoulders and squeezed her into a solid half-hug. The odds of survival were not in their favor. The compass was all that was left of the two great human colonies. The other inhabitants had either been killed or sold off as slaves to the hostile species in the sector. Jane's ship wasn't even intimidating, it was just a small science vessel, broken and orphaned, fighting against the odds, toothless, and innocuous in the absence of Tam's sturdier combat ship. There was not a single person in the galaxy on whom the Compass crew could count in their hour of need, Cora Mirellis, however, was one of those anomalies that the universe just couldn't predict and needed to rearrange itself to accommodate. She had stumbled upon a portal to another universe one day after school and had very obstinate ideas of what to do with it. Cora Mirellis had been, at age 14, the first person to ever leave her universe, proving that it was indeed possible, and that they weren't alone out there in existence. On that day, she didn't utter any inspirational words for future generations, nor did she give any grandiose speeches about big steps for humankind. Instead, the stars winked at her, letting her peek at another reality, and that was the most poetic thing the silent cosmos could have told her. Cora pressed her palms against the escape pod's window, her round, childish face pushed anxiously against the transparent material, emotions batting their panicked butterfly-like wings in her chest and colliding mid-flight. The compass closed in on the valiant to tow it inside, occupied by an eerie who should have been very dead by now but was somehow still alive. Cora realized in that moment that she had altered history permanently, and there would be consequences. She had seen enough time travel sci-fi to know that meddling could have serious repercussions. She worried her teeth against the back of her hand, realizing that practice was a lot more chaotic than theory. She was a lot less confident about it now than when she had left her universe that morning. There was no one to ask about how much trouble she was in. Was this kind of stuff allowed? Would the universe still be standing in the morning? She hadn't accounted for any of that. Fingers drummed on the hatch. Maybe she was making a mountain out of a molehill, just because things were different didn't mean they had been changed for the worse, right? Maybe the Compass crew would still decide, of their own volition, to go into the heart of Gold Nebula and this time around they would have a ship in better shape and a telepath to help them make different choices from here on out. Okay, so this created a few variables, but just because things could turn out really bad going forward didn't mean that they would, yeah? The present rippled into some kind of future all the time and no one lost their minds about it. Cora tried to pace inside the pod in her anxiousness, but all she managed to do was hit her knee on one of the seats. She bent down, massaging her kneecap with a grimace, the truth would have to be faced sooner or later, she had no idea what she was doing and needed help. The truth sucked, so she went back to ignoring it for the moment. Don't look at me like that. She muttered to no one in particular certainly not to her podmate who had been unconscious since the Valiant had been attacked. Perhaps Cora was addressing her reflection, with its long hair in disarray and nails bitten into jagged stubs. She might not have even realized she had said anything at all. The blackness of space had turned the window into a mirrored reflection of the interior. They were moving in a dangerous direction. If they waited too long, the pod would be swallowed by the nebula. Cora pictured it for a moment being crushed by gravity, frozen alive, submitted to sudden depressurization, and then fried by radiation. The thought made her sick and panicky, and she suppressed the urge to bang her head against the wall or flap her hands in agitation. Instead, she took a deep breath and tried to hold on to the control she still had, talking herself into reviewing the facts. Eerie was still alive, she had seen him before she left the Valiant. The plan had been to reach him before Jane and Tam had the chance to but reality was nothing like the theory. The compass was still in one piece, it was possible that the Valiant wasn't in as bad a shape as it could be, the other crew members that were supposed to die that day had all been extracted safely. 
hey, she'd gotten everyone out safely. That part was not bad, yeah, she was almost certain that whatever teleporter the Valiant had been out to test was completely inoperative, and that was Bota blessing and a curse, but it was possible that there was enough of it left from the wreckage for the compass to be able to rebuild it. That would give them an advantage they didn't have before in the other timeline, and that made Cora nervous, but then again wasn't that what she'd wanted, to improve things? When Cora had snuck aboard the Valiant earlier that day, she had been almost certain that everything would work out. She had studied and done the calculations. Her plan, as ambitious as it had been, had involved seamlessly transiting between the Valiant and its escape pods, saving all crew members eerie ejected, ensuring that the crews of the two ships were safe and alive, then fleeing back to her universe before being noticed. She supposed two of four goals was better than nothing, but that still left a lot of loose ends to tie up. As if on cue, the unconscious woman in the other corner stirred, and Cora was snapped back to the very pressing need to get them out of there to a safe place. One problem at a time. The timeline Cora altered. Present time. The corridors closest to the hangar were unsteady ground, Jane pushed her way through them anyway. The battle had finally quieted, but it might have been too late, the glow of the Heart of Gold Nebula struck her dark-skinned face, its light sneaking into her ship through the windows like a stowaway. Outside, a fleet of debris scattered around her in a silent threat. She shouldn't have let Eerie go on this mission. He had been babbling away all morning about some strange feeling he had been having, about double-checking the security protocols, she should have grounded him. She should have grounded his crew. She should have postponed the test. She should have confined them all to the cargo area. She should have. Jane quickened her steps, her sols ricocheting against the unstable floor, made uneven by gunfire a few minutes prior. The rhythm of her footfalls complemented her frantic heartbeat, her pulse pounding in her ears, a wordless prayer. Please be alive. Please be alive. Please be alive, somehow. She got a strong sense of deja vu, like she was stuck reliving this nightmarish part of her life, the hangar doors flung open to allow her in. In the farthest corner of the room, the remains of the Valiant still smoldered. Next to the wreckage, her crew crouched near a motionless figure in an exosuit, Artie Med's medical droids flying around them. Jane's footsteps halted, her breath catching involuntarily. Tam, her co-captain, turned to face her. Breathe. Jane, it was just a scare, he said. His hands settled on her shoulders in a reassuring way, and he added, as a joke, The ship might be wrecked beyond repair, but the jerk who was flying it is hard to kill. That damn telepath can see the future, now. We would be dead by now if it wasn't for him. Jane let out the breath she'd been holding, relief washing over her. She was so relieved in fact that she could cry, but she held it in, trying to be professional. She kept herself in check, her gaze turned to her crewman lying on a stretcher. Relief was quickly replaced by guilt. They had lost other crew members. She would need to arrange the funeral services once things settled down. She swore under her breath, cursing time, space and the Akka, as they snatched her crew away from her. Hello, Jane. I'm still alive, thankfully. I hope that burial safe is just over the ship I broke. The voice came muffled and distorted through the spacesuit speaker, Eerie's face still hidden as the team struggled with the helmet's faulty clasps and the temperamental life support. That's the reason for my burial face, for sure, Eerie, Tam said, shaking an accusatory finger, lips quirking in amusement. If we ever manage to go back to paying people, you bet we'll deduct it from your pay. Oh, dear. Mm, my dream of a quiet retirement is ruined, Captain. Eerie lamented sarcastically as the hands of the crew around him slipped from his helmet, failing to remove it, and he was accidentally catapulted backwards onto his stretcher, grey silver hair sticking at odd angles to his slightly wrinkled face, Jane allowed herself a watery smile. Well, on the positive side, Eerie, you're much more suited as a consultant than a pilot. Speaking of which, you're fired. As Jane lifted her hand in a double thumbs up, Eerie's laughter rang from a speaker in the suit. He teased after he had caught his breath. How about Maro? Jane suggested, glancing at Tam. Tam pretended to think for a moment before responding with a smirk. Yeah, 
I guess Eri really hasn't been pulling his weight lately. He put his flesh arm around Jane's shoulder. It's settled then. We'll drop him off on the first habitable planet and make a run for it. Eri's helmet came loose with a hiss, muffling his pseudo-indignant protest as he was thrown backwards, his hands flapping in an attempt to keep his balance. Oh, I dunno, Captain. Becca piped in with a playful smile, brushing her red hair away from her face. She placed Eri's helmet under her arm and struck a contemplative pose. He is adorable. Can't we keep him? Eri glared at Becca in betrayal, as if to say ET2. The medical droids hesitated. Captain, I'm experiencing an impasse in my recently run processes. Am I allowed to take the consultant now, or would it be tactless of me not to wait for the end of the human interaction? Cut Artie Med from one of the droid speakers. He sounded quite confused, considering he was an artificial intelligence. Eerie startled, surprised by the presence of the only member of the crew whose consciousness he couldn't feel, and clung to irritation, responding by reflex. Holy pioneers. You're a medical android. If I were bleeding to death, would you wait for them to stop their little quips? Frankly, that's your job. What do you think? I think if you were actually bleeding out, you'd treat the ship's doctor somewhat better that's for sure, offered Becca, pinning him with a reproaching stare and making soothing motions toward Artie. I've changed my mind, Captain. This thing we just hauled back in with the ship is clearly rotten. You can throw him back out now. Run away as quickly as you can and don't look back. Eerie pressed one of his hands to his chest, his mouth hanging open in a mock-hurt expression. Jane smothered a laugh on the back of her hand. Her friends glanced at her from the corner of their eyes trying to be discreet about being pleased with themselves. Captains? Greg called out. His eyes flicked over one of the monitors, brow furrowed in concern. His tone was so uncertain that his statements were almost questions. We seem to have recovered an escape pod. One of the pods is drifting slowly toward us. The mood in the hangar shifted, and the crew practically tripped over each other on the way back to their stations. Tam and Jane exchanged somber looks. I'm fine, Artie. Medical care can wait, protested Eerie, dodging a medical droid. Any survivors? Greg, asked Jane in an urgent tone. There's no way of knowing. The life support systems are working, so there is a chance there might be, answered Greg, frowning. What do you think, Eerie? Eerie grimaced and opened his mouth hesitantly, as if he was changing his mind midway a lot about what he was going to say. I can't sense anyone, he said finally. Eerie's eyebrows knit and he looked disoriented for a moment. For months he had sensed a strange mind among his Compass colleagues, but there was never anyone there when he went to investigate. The presence came and went, like an old friend showing up on hard days, like thunder before the storm. The presence had been in Valiant earlier, and that was how he knew things would get out of hand, that was how he had taken precautions. Eerie had assumed, with a wave of panic and euphoria, that his telepathic powers, the result of a science experiment, might have been evolving into premonitory skills but all the tests had come back inconclusive, he thought, with a twinge of guilt, of the two casualties of the day, the two crew members dead under his leadership. He would never see them again. He couldn't sense their minds in the escape pod either. Eerie shook his grey head and filed his feelings in a place where he could pick them up later. The pod is empty. He concluded, Tam threw Jane a skeptical look, and a serious expression darkened his face. Careful now. He advised Becca and Greg. We can't afford to throw equipment away right now, but it's very strange for a pod to come floating back to us on its own post-battle. Be suspicious of everything before you decide to bring it in. Aye, Aye Captain. Captain. Greg and Becca made quick and efficient work of it, their well-trained and well-oiled teams conducting all applicable tests, from radiation leaks to system overloads. Eventually, apprehensively, and holding their breaths, they pulled the escape pod in, it opened with a depressurization hiss, and they confirmed that it was, in fact, empty. The windows of Jane's room offered a stunning view of the heart of gold nebula in all its glory. Stars twinkled and peaked between the colorful ionized gases of the imposing cloud, which stretched like a horizon in shades ranging from scorching blue to solar gold. It was absolutely beautiful. In the captain's absence, Cora eagerly took in the natural monument with her young hands pressed against the window, like a child peering into a toy store. Cora had been traveling through this universe and infiltrating the compass for some time now. 
Yet, she still marveled every time she realized she was in space and could not ignore the lack of real gravity. The afternoons she had spent sitting in a tick-filled abandoned lot of a poor Brazilian neighborhood, stuck in her universe, seemed like an eternity behind her. She watched as the escape pod, now empty, was towed inside. She knew the compass was strapped for resources and decided, with shaky conviction, that it didn't matter anymore if they found her out on their ship. She hoped it was the right decision. The woman she had rescued from the pod was her most recent passenger. For months, Cora had been removing crew members from their timelines mere minutes before their deaths. When she thought about it, it was impressive how long she had managed to get away with it before anything really went wrong, especially considering she had no idea what she was doing. However, where to put these people had been another problem. Cora was young and inexperienced, but not stupid. She knew the story of the compass well enough to understand that if she messed with the arrangement of the pieces on the board too much, they would all end up dead. Returning the crew to the ship was not an option. Flashback It had taken a while to explain to Tomi, the woman from the pod, what had happened, and she had almost had to push her through the portal to convince her to move. Overall, the Compass and Valiant crews had reacted far better than she had anticipated as she whisked them away and showed them the new world that was the best option for their settlement. Fortunately, Tomi had not been an exception. Maybe it was something about constant war, maybe it was related to having watched the end of the world as they knew it, or maybe they all secretly thought that they had died in their respective accidents and were just confused about the afterlife. To me, this is Earth, said Cora adjusting the backpack on her shoulders as she sat with her legs dangling over the edge of the building. The panorama unfolded in front of her, magnificent and almost alien, with ships darting around the orderly city skyline. Cora gave no other indication of noticing it other than a slight upwards quirk of her lips, her eyes fixed on Tomi. There are other humans living here, so I think you and your crewmates will be able to blend in well if you'd like. It's the safest place I know, I think this version of humanity hasn't seen war in a while. If everything goes well, the compass should eventually arrive. The last time I checked, your colleagues were planning the welcome party. Cora offered Tomi a friendly smile as the adult sat down next to the girl, dangerously dizzy, a hand on her forehead. When Tomi asked, What do you mean there are other humans here? Her question sounded like a protest and an accusation. The other humans died with the colonies. Is this a planet of slaves? Cora clumsily placed her hand on Tomi's arm in a comforting gesture, hoping to calm her. Despite hearing the same line of questioning from other crew members, Cora's gentle smile never faltered. Relax, it's not that kind of planet. Your people are descended from lost astronauts, right? You never wondered where they came from. Cora paused, waiting for her words to sink in before continuing. If you're optimistic, it's kind of like a family reunion a few centuries later. As Tomi curiously surveyed the city, Cora settled more comfortably on the ledge. They sat together in silence for a while, interrupted only by Tomi's questions. They will think I died. Tomi asked abruptly, as if the idea had just occurred to her. You told me that the compass is in another galaxy, and my return there now would damage their chances to get here. In the meantime, will they think I died? Cora nodded, her smile fading. If I put you back in there, they would make different choices, and it would hurt their chances of getting this far. She recited, as if she had practiced the answer dozens of times. However, her tone no longer had the conviction it once did. Cora hadn't had much time to think about it, but the truth was that things were different now, and her explanation sounded like an excuse. Erie shouldn't have stayed there, yet he did. Cora didn't have a good reason to move Jane and Tam's crew unless she admitted to herself that she was following a plan that had already gone wrong. She shook herself mentally and filed away her inner conflict for when she was alone and without adults who could make her plan look even worse than it was. Instead, she changed the subject. Do you think this looks like a bad planet to live on? Tomi looked around, evaluating the movement of ships in the sky and buildings in strange shapes. Alien and robotic faces peacefully mixed in with the human. Not when you're used to war zones, she answered, shrugging. I do believe they might be happy here, and if I realize they won't be, I shall be around to warn them. 
I suppose I should look for the others. If you're lying, it would bear no consequence at this juncture. I can always steal a ship and make my own conclusions. Cora raised her eyebrows. Overall, it was a much better reaction than the aggressive protests she had expected. In fact, she was surprised by the indifference she had witnessed in many of the crew members. So I can't go back and see my friends? Okay, now what? In the last few days, the idea that she could be trapped in an unknown universe had caused her nausea and nightmares. However, she assumed that when you had survived the end of the world, there wasn't much more that could shake a person. Deep down, she knew that wasn't true, otherwise, there wouldn't have been such an intense effort to rescue Eerie from the wreckage of the Valiant. That part had been more difficult than she had anticipated. Cora had to admit, with a hint of shame, that she had become overconfident, when she had started rescuing them, she had constantly reassured herself that it didn't matter that she had little experience in these matters, the most that could happen was that she failed to save the lives of crewmen who were already going to die, right? It wouldn't have improved things, but it wouldn't have made them worse either, in practice, when she came face to face with the situation and realized that she had badly planned Eerie's rescue, this was not how she had felt. By positioning Eerie at a strategic distance for his rescue, she had unwittingly made the Akka, a hostile species in the sector, direct more attention to the Valiant than they would naturally do. Ignoring the compass. At that moment, when the smaller ship was about to be brutally destroyed in crossfire, and the shields threatened to fail, and Eerie was about to be fried by the radiation of nearby stars, Cora had felt guilt. Despite having a time machine, she hadn't calculated the correct coordinates for an emergency rescue and didn't know what consequences there would be if she tried to cause a paradox in an event she had personally witnessed. When the compass had gloriously emerged from the ion trails and shot the Akka ship, the first feeling that took over Cora, sheltered in the last escape pod, was relief. She discovered, with amazement, that she was relieved because she wouldn't have to see Eerie die because of her, the fact that she felt responsible didn't go unnoticed by her and she tried to contest it. When had the survival of the Compass's crew become her responsibility? She was a fourteen-year-old who hadn't even finished grade school yet, a part of her mind, the part that felt guilty, argued that she was apparently old enough to cause ripples in space-time, so she must be old enough to fix them. Yes, because now she would have to deal with possible butterfly effects. And so, with a sudden slap of awareness, she would allow herself to admit that she had bitten off more than she could chew. She would need help if she wanted to avoid a disaster, and at this moment, she knew very few people who could do just that. Present time. Jane Skye entered her quarters, her boots dragging heavily with fatigue. She felt guilty leaving Tam to deal with the mess, but after the adrenaline had worn off and Erie was safe in the medical wing without a scratch on him, both compass commanders had agreed that one of them should rest and take over the morning shift since they couldn't decide on a course of action and weren't in immediate danger. Jane stretched as the doors closed behind her with a snap of pressurization and took off her shoes. She planned to change out of her uniform, take a shower, and sleep until… Suddenly, Jane froze. There was someone in her quarters, their silhouette outlined against the window. Instinctively, the captain reached for the gun at her waist with one hand and the communicator with the other. She would proceed with caution and alert security, but before she could react, the intruder turned to face her. The girl appeared human, about fifteen years old or younger, with brown hair and a braided ponytail, dark eyes under thick eyebrows, and wearing an unfamiliar uniform. The girl's curious gaze lit up upon seeing Jane. Captain Jane Sky, she cried holding out her hands in an agitated, awkward wave. Her eyes swept over Jane's stern face and followed her arms. Comprehension dawned on her face, and her smile faded into an embarrassed expression. Ah, Yes, I'm an intruder, aren't I? Yeah, I guess that's fair enough. My name is Cora, and I don't present a threat, really. Cora held out her hands again to show she was unarmed, then opened her backpack to reveal an impressive amount of vegetable fiber, or as Cora would call it, paper. There was a tense pause as Cora rubbed the back of her head nervously, looking steadily at the floor as she readjusted the backpack on her shoulders. Jane relaxed her posture, but she didn't take her hand off the communicator or the gun. Her heart was pounding in her throat. 
Part of her wanted to shoot and set off all of the ship's alarms, it was the most logical course of action. They were almost three parsecs from the nearest trading post, and the presence of an intruder was not a good sign. The presence of a human had to be an illusion. Still, curiosity kept her finger off the trigger. How did you get in here? Jane asked, the girl pointed to an object near the ledge. The box was the biggest mess of wires and cardboard Jane had ever seen in her life, which said more about the human colonies than the object itself since it was the first time the captain had seen cardboard. Cora stood protectively, one leg in front of the device, and regarded the captain warily. I teleported, she said simply. Are you trying to tell me that this thing transported you ten light years into my ship? Jane asked incredulously. Cora squirmed and shot Jane an uncertain look. She stuttered the first few tries before she could actually say anything. Actually, no. But that might be an easier explanation to take in. Don't shoot me, please, but you can call security if you like. Jane blinked, and in the next second, did exactly that before she could change her mind. She set off the alarm on her uniform. Security would take a few minutes to arrive. Jane scrutinized her intruder, Cora, again. She looked like a child, shy, agitated, clumsy, and afraid. Jane hesitantly put the gun down. We have a little time. Why don't you tell me who you really are? She said, her tone gentle, but her face stony. Cora rubbed the back of her neck in the same nervous gesture. I'm human, not from the colonies. She quickly amended. It's kind of a long story. I came here because I made a mistake. A mistake that affects you and I need your help to fix it. Jane stared at her, still not quite following. The girl, because she unconsciously caught herself thinking of her as a girl, and not the shape-shifting alien she probably was, didn't make any sense. Cora sighed and looked out the window again, as if trying very hard to find the words. Look, you've heard of time travel, right? I mean, I know you have. If a time traveler came along and said, surprise, I've made a mess of things and screwed up your history, I need your help to fix it. Well, that's me. Jane's eyebrows rose, and she did some mental math. Her dark features grew paler by the second. Cora continued to chatter, distracted. The hard part is you weren't supposed to save Eri today. Don't get me wrong, I'm glad you did. I didn't want to let him die, but I was supposed to get there before you did. I made a mistake, and- Did you cause the accident? Jane asked, her hand on the alarm going to her forehead instead. She felt dizzy. What? Cora seemed to lose her balance for a moment, disoriented. No, Captain, that was the Ion Storm. And the Archer. No, I meant I was going to get him out of there before the ship exploded. And I was going to get the pod people too. I got the pod people, actually, sorry I only returned one of the escape capsules, but the others were kind of. Did you return the escape pod yourself? Cora frowned and hid her face in her hands, turning to face the wall. I really messed things up, didn't I? Murmured Cora, frustrated. I screwed up so badly that I don't even know where to start. Cora paused, searching for words again. When the guards entered Jane's room a few minutes later, weapons in hand, they found something unexpected. The apparently human girl was talking to the captain with no indication of hostility. Skye raised her hands in a placating gesture and stepped in front of the young girl, signaling not to shoot. Captain. Asked one of the crew members, searching Jane's face with a confused expression. Looks like we have a stowaway. Replied Jane simply. She reached down to her waist to grab her communicator. Tam, I think you'd better get down here. Jane put a hand on Cora's box and looked at its owner in a silent question. Cora fidgeted. It's all right if we examine your box, is it not? asked the captain in a firm tone. Cora hesitated. Jane, deciding not to wait for a definitive answer, took hold of the bundle of wires and handed the object to the nearest crew member. If you could take this tomorrow, please. Ask her to check for space-time travel capabilities. The officer raised an eyebrow, eyeing the box incredulously, and turned to leave. Cora interrupted him shyly. It's just, she began, unsure. Ask Maro not to disassemble it too much. If she can't put it back together, or if she decides to use the pieces to build something else, I'll have no way of getting home. Tam intercepted his officer as he entered, and the two exchanged meaningful glances. 
The valiant commander looked confused as he alternated his gaze between Jane and the intruder. A heavy silence settled, and Cora rocked back and forth on the balls of her feet, trying desperately to relieve the tension she was feeling. Finally, not knowing what to do, she waved. Tam replied with a suspicious look, but Jane took control of the situation. Cora, she said, pointing at the young woman. She claims to be human but not from the colonies. She arrived here using that box, so I'm sending it to Maro for inspection if you're in agreement. Her hands are the safest spot on the ship for unknown technology. We were also discussing time travel. Tam brought a hand to his gun and repeated. Time travel? Got it. And you haven't shot this thing yet, why? Easy, Tam. There has been no display of hostility from her so far. Jane justified, making a placating gesture with her hands. She tried to convince Tam to lower his gun while he stood his ground. I thought the security guard's guns were sufficient as a precaution while we investigate. Where do you think we should put her? Cora waved timidly again, an uncomfortable gesture of someone who didn't know what to do with her hands. Tam was intimidating, standing over a foot taller than her, and his hands, both flesh and metal, had clenched into fists, the metal crackling with tension. This conversation might as well be finished in a holding cell, with extra security, because we don't know what that tangle of wires really is, he said, ignoring the girl. If Yuri is willing, I suggest we defer the final say to him, said Jane. Tam stared at her incredulously. Cora opened her mouth to say something but hesitated the words dying in her throat as Tam turned his gaze back to her. Jane gestured for her to continue. If you need proof that I'm human, you can always send me over to Archie, stammered the girl. A simple DNA test. How the hell do you know the name of our doctor? He questioned, his eyes becoming slits. Everyone in the room turned to her, and Cora covered her eyes with her hands, rocking back and forth on the soles of her feet. Things were spinning out of control fast and she felt vulnerable without her machine. Parallel Earth, she managed to say with effort. I come from a parallel Earth, and they tell stories about you there. You are kind of a legend. I made a mistake and came to make it right. You were not supposed to save Eri today. The Arca are coming, and if I don't do something, it will all go wrong. In the silence that followed, Jane and Tam seemed to reach an understanding in their mute communication. That is the second time you've said that. Jane spoke gently, taking Cora's hands away from her eyes. I'm attempting to understand. What's going to go wrong? Did you say you were supposed to retrieve Yuri before we did? Flashback. The story of how Jane and Tam met. Part 1. There had been a time when Jane and Tam couldn't stand the thought of working together on the same ship. That was before the anomaly. The two human colonies had established themselves solidly in a single solar system, one in space and one planetary. Rumor had it that this species had not originated in that galaxy, and their presence had come as a result of lost astronauts, already disliked in that region of space, the legend that colored them as outsiders did not help humans blend in with the other species around them. Some tolerated them, while others envied them. When the anomaly came and knocked them off their throne, no one missed them. Tam, Steel Punch, Wright was then, despite his young age, the toughest captain in the space-bound colony, and there were not many left who would challenge this statement. He had faced huge armies, orbited black holes in distant sectors, and interacted with completely hostile alien species. There was no ravine in space that he and his ship, the Valiant, could not go to, except under the territory of the planetary colony. Come on! He shouted in his thick space-bound colony accent pulling at his short hair with his fleshy hand, the metal one crackling with tension. With all the demons. It's in the damn deal. I gotta pick up the research team at the base of a canyon in some inhospitable desert where you don't like to go, and you have to let me. The woman on the other side of the desk was unmoved. She was small and frail in appearance, her wild hair restrained by an impeccable bun, practiced to exhaustion, and her movements limited by the impractical clothes of the planetary colony. In an exchange of punches or gunfire, Tam was sure she wouldn't last two seconds, in that room, however, she was the one with all the power. We have to let you provided you have the proper documentation in order, Jane replied in her posh planetary colony lilt, 
scrutinizing him through rectangular glasses that made her look even more like the corporate peace Tam seemed to think she was. The canyon of some inhospitable desert is indeed inhospitable and I cannot let you and your crew go in alone without knowing if the systems are correctly maintained and if you have undergone the proper training. Beyond this point, we are no longer in space, Tam sighed and pinched the bridge of his nose. Damn planetarians and their bureaucracy. Look, the research has an expiration date, he said, with uncharacteristic calm, making sure to see Jane eye to eye. It's medical research, the kind that matters absolutely nothing to the planetary colony because it's not about the kind of disease you get on this planet, it's the kind you get in a trading outpost across the galaxy, where there's no real gravity and the air's cheap and partially toxic. You are from a science ship, you know what I'm talking about. If we don't take these guys back, it's game over. We won't get any more funding for another research study. Jane scrutinized Tam again through her glasses and finally took them off imitating the gesture of pinching the bridge of her nose. Damn astrophiles and their inability to follow simple protocols. Tam watched her, his shoulders tense, without daring to express relief when Jane finally seemed to acquiesce in a defeated sigh. He had never felt so irrationally intimidated, and Jane stared at him sternly. So, here's what we are going to do, she began. I cannot grant you permission to proceed without the proper documentation, nor am I equipped to traverse the tornado desert in this vessel. However, Ain raised her voice when it seemed that Tam was about to interrupt her. I'm authorized to be a scientific escort for a properly equipped ship. Now, don't get too excited. Being your escort means escorting you all the way there and back to wherever you're taking these people. You'll have to improvise at least the engine and weapon system specifications on the corresponding forms. I anticipate a considerable amount of paperwork and a headache and you owe me one. Jane held out two forms. Tam accepted them with one hand and held out the other for her to shake. Jane stared at the large metal hand, taken by surprise, before shyly squeezing it with her smaller, delicate hand. Very well, then, she said. It appears we have an understanding, Captain. Let us endeavor to maintain our partnership as brief and painless as possible. Productive, but short, yes. Agreed, said Tam with a wry smile. Hopefully, in a few days, they would be rid of each other. Present time You don't believe that talk, do you, Jane? Asked Tam, watching the girl from behind the force fields he had convinced Jane to erect as a security measure. We didn't go through everything we've been through just to be tricked by an alien disguised as a tourist from the future. If I didn't have any doubts, I wouldn't have sent the box tomorrow, would I? Replied Jane. Tam shook his head and faced Jane again. I suppose you've killed some time listening to her so far. What's this brilliant suggestion that's going to be the magical solution from the future to all our problems? We were just at that point when security came in, and that's what seems the strangest thing. Cora doesn't seem to believe there's a magic solution, said Jane. Her idea is that in the near future, we'll be desperate enough to get into the heart of Gold Nebula, and then we'll need help. Tam stared at his companion as if she had lost her mind. And what part of this story did you think was worth even considering? He said, his voice rising instinctively. It's obviously someone trying to lead us into an ambush because it's much easier for us to die once inside the nebula. Jane shrugged. The part where her story makes a modicum of sense and it seems like a good time for a miracle. Tam, Jane said, falling into the old habit of trying to adjust the glasses that were no longer there. If nothing else, you have to agree that we are in a pretty bad position here between a nebula and a crossfire. We are outnumbered, too. If the nebula is an option, no matter how absurd, it is worth investigating. Have you ever thought that this thing she brought aboard might be a tracker? Or a bomb? Well, if it is a tracker, it is very discreet because I asked Trisha while you were setting up the force fields, and the internal sensors are not picking up a signal. It would have been much easier to hide from us in the confusion, but for some reason, she thought she should contact us. A human? In the middle of this sector, said Tam, pinching the bridge of his nose. Jane, I know you want to have hope, but we have to face reality at some point. The only humans left around here are the ones who became slaves to some neighboring species. Maybe Maro's evaluation will come back and say that it is what she claims it is, but it could still be a trap. 
maybe it won't come back at all. And what if the Aka return? Are we really going to risk going into a nebula that's a certain death trap? Cora bit her lip. She could see Tam and Jane arguing on the other side of the force field. Eerie, who was very confused about the information he had received, had been watching her intently for the last few minutes, followed her gaze and frowned. I hope they are not fighting too seriously because of me, said Cora. It's been a long time since they've had a disagreement. You talk as if you know them, he observed. In a way, I do, she said. A strange expression came over her face. You're a telepath. You can enter my mind and confirm it if you like. Eerie watched her cautiously. You want me to enter your mind? Would that make you feel better, to have your story confirmed in this way? He asked gently. Cora shrugged. I wouldn't like to, but it would probably put them both at ease. She reasoned. In that case, I reserve the right not to like it, either, and we can always object to things we do not like, he said. I will not go into your mind if you do not want to let me in. They have less invasive ways of confirming your story. Cora nodded and ventured a peek at Eerie's face, examining it. Eerie held her gaze, serene. Aren't you tired? She asked. You could have died today. If you're not going to read my mind you could switch places when Archie gets here. Eerie raised his eyebrows. Actually, I am curious. I understand you had something to do with my rescue. Cora thought it polite not to mention that the direction of the conversation seemed conspicuously appropriate for his initial task of gathering information. Instead, she stared at Eerie with an amused smile for a few seconds before regaining sobriety. Actually, the problem is that it was the compass that saved you. I didn't have much to do with it this time, she said. Eerie nodded. I believed I had developed some sort of premonitory power, a sensor for impending disasters, but it was you all along, was it not? This whole time, coming and going, he said, smiling. Cora's eyes widened in surprise. Eerie chuckled. Your mind is particularly loud, my dear, even when I cannot comprehend your thoughts. It's like music playing in a silent room. Cora squirmed, uneasy and chanced a glance at the captains behind the force field who were now watching her in silence. She couldn't quite bring herself to face them, and instead looked down at her shoes. They're listening in on the conversation, aren't they? She asked. Eerie nodded, looking uncomfortable. Well, I guess this way I won't have to repeat myself too much, I'm not very good at the whole talking thing. I think the damage is done, but from here on out you'll have to decide what to do. I guess it didn't register with Captain Jane earlier, but I have been rescuing the crew of the Compass. There was a tense pause. I'm afraid I don't quite understand your meaning. Eerie said, confused, Cora sighed. I'm saying that I've spent the last few weeks rescuing Compasses and Valiant's crew members out of scenarios where they were going to die and putting them somewhere else. There are a bunch of them that I hope you can find again, that you should find again if you keep going where you are going. Jane, before she was fully aware of what she was doing, lowered the force field and stood in front of Cora, her face concerned. What crew members? Well, the most recent was a girl named to me. Greg's girlfriend. She was fixing things by the escape pods when that piece of the Valiant was destroyed. She said. Jane pressed a palm to her forehead and turned her back to Cora. Tam reached over and placed his flesh hand on her arm as she looked at the girl her expression indecipherable. I'm sorry that you thought they were dead. I... I was trying to avoid a butterfly effect. Cora offered a humorless and bitter smile, perhaps too bitter to be on such a young face. I guess it doesn't matter anymore. Flashback The story of how Jane and Tam met. Part 2 Wait a minute, we've got a babysitter now. Becca asked, her mouth full as she tried to down her piece of bread with the cheap wine in her mug. I'm not sober enough for that, agreed Ida, stealing a sip from Becca's mug. Another round. Someone shouted, and there was an exclamation of agreement throughout the room as the rookies ran to get the bottles, under the laughter of the elders. Meals at the Valiant were always like this, everyone gathered in the same dining hall, often joining disparate tables to make one huge, uneven, surface, uniforms unbuttoned as they talked loudly over each other. Those who were off duty for the next shift drank, while those who were not made fun of the drunks. Tam tipped his mug toward Becca. I'll drink to that, he said. 
The sooner we get rid of them, the better. A scrappy little ship like that's gonna be a pain in the ass and a half to maneuver at low altitudes, not to mention all the hassle that's dealing with planetarians, lamented Ida. How big a pile of junk do they think we are? Tam. I don't suppose we could pull a few engine pops to at least get them off our backs. Tam shrugged, but his mouth twisted into an amused smile. If you are suggesting we make them think our ship is breaking down and then make a run for it once we get the passengers on board, I don't know anything about it. He said, getting up. My shift ended 15 minutes ago and I was in my quarters, not here to listen to this chat. You know how unpredictable these astrophile ship crews are. The crew smiled conspiratorially and jokingly booed the captain as he left. When the room had quieted down enough, Becca asked, So, do you prefer we've a better engine than you and your idiots, or you shouldn't have led us into planetary territory and your idiots kind of popping? Greg Diaz stood in front of his captain's desk, the last appointment of a long day. He was sweaty and pasty, young lips trembled over the fuzz of his beard. His clothes, usually spotless, were stained of engine fluid, his hair, matted, stuck to his head in an unpleasant way, the result of hours of hard and fruitless work in the engine room. He looked absolutely miserable. Jane had to admire his perseverance. Captain. He began, blinking the sweat from his eyes, his round face furrowed in determination. I must, I really must object and request that you abort the mission. In fact, I have compiled a list of the most relevant objections, ranked in order of significance, to avoid wasting your time. He held out a document to her. Jane couldn't contain her smirk. Greg was not the first and, she suspected, would not be the last to emerge. The mission was proving to be more problematic than they had expected. During the day, the ship had crawled, its sensors acting up, and even Jane had to admit that, Unable to see more than a few meters ahead in the raging thunderstorms, they were humiliatingly dependent on the adjacent ship not to lose their way. Well, you have been waiting around all day, she said, interlacing her fingers. How many pages is this thing? The abridged version, if you please. When, then? Let us start at the top of the list, shall we? Proposed Greg, taking a seat. Did you happen to notice that that ship is making pops? Jane repeated the word silently straightening in her chair. Pops, she repeated aloud. What kind of popping? Greg held up his hands defensively. Our sensors are barely operational, how should I know? Jane pinched the bridge of her nose. Something tells me you have a hunch. What I have is a poor visual assessment, he said. It could be that this is characteristic of their engine, it could be that they have some kind of leakage, or... Oh. I would venture to say that the power supply to the impulse system is irregularly interconnected with the overlight system causing them to pop in the very fabric of space, Greg said. Jane raised her eyebrows and began scrutinizing the document. This would explain in part why our sensors are failing. It would also be wholly irregular, of course, and give us ample reason to abort the mission. In the best case scenario, they might experience energy disruptions that cause hull disruptions or even cause the ship to explode in our faces, or- Or, oh, interrupted Jane, they are trying to frighten us by plugging the extender of one engine into the receiver of the other and controlling the pops with a flow stabilizer. Greg hesitated. That may be so. He begrudgingly admitted, and Jane smiled. However, if that is not the case, I must remind you that we have no medical personnel, and we will be unable to provide proper assistance in case of emergency. And come to think of it, we cannot be certain if their vessel has any medical staff either. These are all compelling reasons to cancel the mission. Firstly, while the artificial medical droids may be experimental, they do provide some measure of support. Secondly, if you are suggesting that their vessel is on the brink of exploding, I hope to find in this report, which looks more like a school assignment for extra credit, some evidence of radioactive leakage, which is what would happen if the two systems were fused together by accident, Greg's eyes widened, and Jane shrugged, I may only be the brainy and bureaucratic captain of a science ship, but I have accumulated experience in this role that surpasses your own tenure," she said casually. If that was all you had to report, I request that you utilize that same tenacity to devise a plan to maintain the Valiant's position alongside us. We will arrive at our destination in approximately half an hour, and that will leave us with only the time allotted for them to load their ship as collateral. If they wish to get rid of us, they can do so when we reach open space, and not sooner. 
Dismissed. Plan to secure the Valiant's position? Sure. Grumbled Greg. Hey, I'm just the chief engineer. What do I know? Greg left resigned but with a stiff step, and Jane sighed. They had started off on the wrong foot, and for all his defiance, she hoped deep down that her trust in Tam would not be misplaced. Present Time Cora sat on a stretcher, swinging her legs restlessly like a child while Artie Med, the ship's medical android, arranged for a DNA sample. The girl watched with curiosity as Artie's thin, metallic body wobbled awkwardly and bent down to scan her. Morrow, a blue alien with a stretched face and the kind of expressive eccentricity that made her easy to like, was examining with similar intensity the same precarious box that Cora had brought a few hours earlier. Cora found it easier to trust them both. Their emotions seemed milder and more obvious, simpler to understand. The fact that Morrow had helped improve Artie's program could be part of the reason. And you came up with this? She asked incredulously. And you did all that stuff you said you did, rescuing crew members and putting them in another galaxy, with that? Morrow had no eyebrows, so she elected to open her eyes a little wider in a cartoony and exaggerated way. Cora laughed before she could contain herself, and the blue alien's expression rearranged itself into one of fondness. She believed 200% that this was a human child, especially when her dark eyes sparkled with curiosity. I still don't believe it either, said the girl, recovering. But it's either that or we've all been hallucinating for a while. Well, it's like they say back home, you don't question the daily miracle, offered Morrow, smiling. Cora nodded and then looked quickly to the corner of the room where Jane, Tam, and Eerie had disappeared. Her brow furrowed in concern. You know what I don't get about this story of yours, said Morrow, amiably. Of all places, how did you end up here? Cora shrugged and offered Morrow an amused smile. You could be in many other places, why are you here? Asked the girl. Morrow mirrored her shrug. I wanted to see the universe, to explore new stars, she said. Cora nodded. Well, so did I. By the way, you are my first official alien, and that's really cool. But you could have hitched a ride with any ship that stopped at your planet, there are aliens all over the galaxy. Why the compass? Morrow hesitated, gills flaring. I guess I wanted to feel useful, replied the blue alien sincerely. There's a lot I could do here. This crew needs all the help they can get, don't they? The atmosphere dissolved into a pleasant silence, which Artie Med finally interrupted. Not that anyone has asked me. I just wanted to state for the record that I never had a choice, and that was activated here. And once again, I am the decorative object in the room while the real people talk. He said, his android face serious but his tone obviously light, waving a test tube. There was an amused pause, but the android looked around worriedly. I would like to register that this was an attempt to connect with my patients through humor and does not represent my true feelings. Cora and Maro laughed, and the blue alien nodded at the doctor. If nothing else had hooked me, that he would have seduced me all by himself, she said, giving the android a friendly pat on the arm. Artie reciprocated by squeezing her hand warmly. If you had not stayed, the chief engineers would have dismantled me by accident by now. Artie Med said affectionately, and then the screen of his face contorted into a frown. Do not tell them I said that. Cora stifled a giggle with her hand, and Morrow merely smiled. Artie busied himself collecting his test tubes, but Cora caught a glimpse of a smile when she looked into his face. The artificial doctor rarely used facial expressions when in Morrow's company, so she knew the gesture must be for her benefit. Humans were easily startled by that which was not similar to them. I am done here, said Artie Med, turning to Morrow. Will you take the results to the captains for face-to-face -face discussion? Morrow nodded. Do you have to take the box, too? Asked Cora suddenly. I think that's expected, replied the alien. Is there any reason not to? Cora bit her lip. Well, she began. There are two. Do you think you could keep the specifics of its functionality a secret? I don't want to do any more damage to the timeline. Easily, said Morrow, smiling understandingly. Because so far, I don't really understand how it works, so I'm not going to build one like it, if that's what you're worried about. What is the other reason? Cora hesitated. I wanted to return home sometime, she said, 
I'm just waiting for you to decide whether you need me here or not. Did you understand enough to conclude that this is not a bomb? Mara's eyes widened, serving as her substitute for raised eyebrows. You didn't come to stay, then. I have class tomorrow, she replied simply. Cora frowned suddenly, as if something had occurred to her. Hey, Mara, maybe you can help me with something. The girl took out a stash of papers and diagrams from her backpack. She had done and redone the planning several times this time. I have a crazy plan, and I need a second opinion. Well, Jane asked as soon as Maro entered her office. She and Tam had been talking in circles for the last half hour. They didn't know if they could trust their intruder. They didn't know how they were going to get out of that sector of space. They didn't know how much time they had before another ship would find them. Eerie had lectured them about Cora's presence foreshadowing disaster. The prospect of new information was very welcome. Everything is in order over there, said Maro. Ati said that she is as human as the rest of you, and, as far as I know, that machine can very well do what she says it does. However, she added, looking at Tam, if you were expecting this to be your golden ticket to another universe, I'm sorry to say, but I don't think the machine could take many people at once. Cora said that the recharge time could be great, and from my analysis, I agree, Tam frowned. So the machine would help her escape, but not us, right? He said in an accusing tone, Mara nodded. This is really worrisome, Jane, from every perspective, Tam said, flicking a glance at the compass captain and then adding with a rueful expression at Mara. I'm a bit afraid of the answer, but where did you leave the thing? With Cora, after all, it's hers, said Mara. And do you not think she could use it to get away? Asked Jane. Maro shrugged. She said she would wait until we had reached a decision, said Maro. Tam raised an eyebrow. I am of the opinion that if she came to us of her own volition, it is only fair that she lives of her own volition. This ship is dangerous for a human child. Tam and Jane exchanged uncomfortable glances. Tell me something, Maro. Jane began, frowning. Do you think Cora is capable of building something that could be of some use? She mentioned a shield and maybe a better engine. I think that if this girl can build, out of precarious materials, something that will take her out into the universe and get her home by dinner time, I would say that our chances are good with her. I also think that I have gills and I'm on a starship, if you know what I mean. Flashback the story of how Jane and Tam met. Part 3 Jane was awakened from her sleep less than 15 minutes after she had closed her eyes. Tam Wright's completely livid face greeted her in an urgent call on her portable communicator. Is something wrong? She asked, sitting up in her bed and hiding a yawn with the back of her hand. You know very well what the problem is, accused Tam. What's with the anchor? I thought we were in agreement to leave together in the morning so I could have enough time to inspect my senses, said Jane innocently. I fail to comprehend what difference does it make if I docked in your ship or in the laboratory. And do you plan to use my ship as a towing service the entire trip? He asked through gritted teeth, Jane, raised her eyebrows. As far as I know, the compass continues to operate with its own impulse engine, meaning we are not being towed by the Valiant, if that is what you are implying. Our top speed will still be the top speed of the group, or have you forgotten that we have to arrive together? Upon arrival at the trading post, I guarantee that you will be free of me. Tam did not seem to calm down, on the contrary, Jane had the distinct impression of hearing metal bending under the grip of his metallic fist. She watched him more closely. What is really bothering you? She asked. I feel like there's something I'm missing. Tam watched her, warring with himself for a moment. Finally, he said, at this pace, we won't make it in time. I've talked to the team and we're really pressed for time. I am sorry to hear that, Jane said, genuinely sorry, and added gently. Since I refuse to let you get away from me, do you think you could turn off the popping? That would be helpful. Tam looked away with an embarrassed smile. I should have known, he said. But, no. Sorry, but underlight is not good enough, the samples will spoil. And the Valiant could perform an instant overlight glide on planetary territory, resulting in significantly expedited arrival. Because you have a hybrid engine. She offered. Tam stared at her in astonishment. Jane shrugged. That is why you didn't file the engine documents, she said simply. 
Planetary politics would never approve a non-standard engine. Besides, it explains why the two engines were already connected. And you risked your job to follow us here? Asked Tam incredulously. I did not take any risks, said Jane. You lied to me. By the way, that is the official version. If something went wrong, you lied to me, and the government can figure out the rest for themselves, Tam smiled. And long live the civil war, he inquired. That is why I knew you wouldn't attempt anything stupid without at least agreeing with me on what Fossard we are telling the bosses when this is over. Your ability to fabricate is commendable. I bet even the warehouse is not the one you marked on the report, she said, smiling back. Tam gave her a look of mock outrage. Woman, you're gonna change my mind about planetarians, he said. You're absolutely right, by the way, and this is the only time you'll ever hear me say that, so cherish it. I suppose you have an alternative plan you're more comfortable with? Jane's eyes sparkled with ingenuity. This will never work, exclaimed Greg, looking at the schematics that Jane had just placed in front of him. He had been pulled out of bed in the middle of the night and preferred to believe he was stuck in a nightmare. And even if it were possible, we are going to get caught, that is certain. It is going to work, assured Jane. We will adhere to the schedule and the cloud of interference the Valiant has been emitting will cover us up. And why do you think I am going to cover it up? Asked Greg. Captain, this mission should have been over long ago. Well, you have not reported us yet. She observed. Look, if you would rather, we will leave you behind and you may transmit a distress signal once the interference has dissipated. But if there is a guy with enough expertise to make this crazy plan work, my money is on you. Greg hid his face in his hands. Why are we doing this, anyway? He asked. Because we can. She replied, putting a hand on Greg's shoulder. Because no one else would. Because it is potentially life-saving research. Because we want to find out how a hybrid engine works. Greg didn't seem impressed. Or perhaps because otherwise we would have to explain how we let a ship with illegal equipment cross the borders when there is bureaucracy to prevent that and we do not want to be demoted today. Greg pinched the bridge of his nose. Jane smiled. Consider it a unique opportunity for scientific exploration. I do not know anyone who has attempted what we are going to do. I really hate you, Captain. He muttered, irritated, but his voice lacked venom. I know. You tell me this at least once a week, regularly, since I hired you. I pay attention, she replied, slipping an arm around the younger man's shoulders. May I inquire how we will prevent the crew from alerting the authorities? Sighed Greg, resigned. We will get the researchers. We will say that the samples require specific refrigeration that the Valiant is unequipped to provide, which is not a lie. You will empty the night shift by having your people make the preparations in the laboratories. Meanwhile, we will make the preparations in the engine room. We. Oui. I shall accompany you. The additional manpower will expedite the process and I possess experience as I used to be part of the machinery crew. She said. Great. Greg replied sarcastically. Anyway, as I was saying, we get the engine ready and the Valiant takes over from there. We drop off the passengers and on the way back, the Valiant tows us to the nearest trading post, where we should have clocked in. We know that they are not going to run off because we have the cargo in our possession and because the ships are anchored to each other. The record shall indicate that the task has been accomplished, and if any inquiries are made, the blessed bureaucracy of the level above will come to the conclusion that it is better to sweep it under the rug than to prosecute someone with a solid alibi. And what about Trisha? Will she not try to pull out of the glide when she realizes? Jane snorted derisively. Trisha will be commanding the glide from Valiant's command room, she said. Greg stared at her, shocked. She's a halfling, remember? She is used to the spacebound antics. Are we going to make this work or not? When Jane finally entered the N2 laboratory in the late morning, the refrigeration system had been properly transitioned and the engineering crew looked absolutely exhausted, so she decided to dismiss them for the remainder of the shift. It was actually better if there were not too many people around the engine in the next few minutes. That brought her face to face with the desert tornado researchers as they made their final arrangements. Captain, greeted the expedition leader. Doctor, she greeted back, eyeing him with interest and offering her hand in a friendly squeeze. The man smiled a pleasant smile. Always so formal, the planetary ships, he said. I would prefer you call me Eerie. Jane nodded, widening her eyes in recognition. Welcome aboard, 
welcomed the captain, and, despite not being military, she almost felt the need to salute the crew. I have a plethora of questions for later, believe me. Everything is almost ready. Jane took a few steps back and turned on her communicator. Trisha, how are you doing? All clear here, Captain. Are we ready? Jane stole a glance at Erie and he gave her an affirmative sign. Grant me two minutes and power them up, then, Trisha. Jane ran toward the command room, her light, smooth cloth shoes slipping and sliding as she ran. She made the last turn just in time to see the ship accelerating on the various monitors, and clung to the doorframe to keep from toppling over with the momentum. Captain, we are over light, Trisha announced proudly. The compass is gliding perfectly alongside the Valiant, two parsecs to go. That should allow time for a nap, if you like. Jane grinned from ear to ear. I'm wide awake. All things considered, you work surprisingly well together, observed Eerie as they unloaded the samples at the alien space station a few hours later. Tam frowned, and Jane laughed. You mean breaking laws and getting ourselves into trouble? Certainly, she said playfully punching Tam's metal arm and rubbing her hand to alleviate the impact. When I said you would owe me one, I had no idea. Tam raised an eyebrow. I consider that I am paying you back just by not kidnapping your pilot. Trisha is excellent, and I'm not happy about having to let her return with your ship. Jane shrugged and offered him a mischievous smile. Remarkable for a slow scientific vessel, wouldn't you agree? Tam replied with an evasive murmur. Well, while we are on the subject, I would like to ask which of the ships I should board, said Erie. Are you going somewhere? asked Jane, confused. If Erie goes with you, your story has more credibility, explained Tam. We had a fake cargo set up in the meantime. We will unload it at the outpost that we agreed on beforehand, so that you can get the paperwork right, and then we will come back here. I will be going alone because my team is required here. However, from a political standpoint, I am the face of the project and my signature should suffice as proof, said Eerie. Jane was at a loss for words, trying to choose what to say, and making sure that her facial expression conveyed her appreciation. Finally, she spoke, looking at Tam. Didn't I tell you that you were good at lying your way and bluffing people? I must admit, you have truly impressed me. I'll take that as a compliment, replied Tam, crossing his arms, a smile in his eyes. It was a compliment, Jane laughed. And Eerie, anytime you want to come on my ship, you are most welcome. You are of spectacular infamy in scientific circles. It will be an absolute privilege to take you to the outpost and write a report about it afterwards. Eerie smiled conspiratorially. Well, now that we're settled, we can go, said Tam. The sooner we go, the sooner we get there. Productive, but short, said Jane, echoing their first conversation. Productive, but short, agreed Tam. Present time Jane and Tam struggled to make the final turn, holding onto the safety handrails to avoid being thrown around by the ship's violent jolts. Trisha, status, commanded Jane, her voice urgent. Captains, the Aka have returned, and they've brought company, Trisha replied through gritted teeth. They and the Jilla seem to think our wreckage would make good decor for the battlefield. I'm trying to lose them, but... She paused as another jolt shook the ship. Damn it. They know how to use 90-degree angles to their advantage. Propulsion is compromised. Engine room, what's the status of the engines? Asked Tam over the communicator, quickly fastening his seatbelt. The overlight engine isn't functioning properly. Greg's voice crackled through the communicator. Siggins, we need a contention wall. Becca's voice shouted in the background. Are we under light? Asked Jane. Not yet, but we will be if they keep shooting at us. We're at 60%. Becca cursed, before communication was cut off abruptly. 60% won't be enough. Trisha cried. Those ships are already faster than us at our maximum speed. We won't be able to outrun them. And our weapons won't do much damage either. Maro! Called Jane over the calm. If you have any miracles up your sleeve, now's the time. On my way to the engine room, Captain. Morrow replied, another jolt shook the ship, and a red light illuminated on one of the panels. Captain, we're under light. Greg's voice came over the calm. We're adrift, Trisha exclaimed. I can't steer. Tam and Jane exchanged panicked glances, 
trying to come up with a plan. Captain's, Cora's high-pitched voice called over the communicator. Jane recognized it immediately. The ships have launched short-range torpedoes, Trisha reported, her voice filled with resigned desperation. The hull won't hold. Impact in five, four, three. Brace for impact. Tam shouted over the calm, an instant stretched into an eternity. As Jane clung to the arms of the command chair, she mentally counted each of her crew members, one by one, memorizing the faces that would die and be forgotten in space, her heart pounding in the back of her throat. Tam, his teeth clenched, imagined the human race ending with them, their best option for survival to be rescued and sold as slaves in some distant corner of the galaxy, but the impact never came. But what the? Captains. The shields are holding. Trisha exclaimed incredulously. We're at 150% defense capacity. Captains, called Cora again, her voice echoing through the command room speaker. This won't last long and will sacrifice the engine. Clear the outer decks. You have to use the advantage to get to the heart of gold, Cora. How did? Jane shook her head. She could ask for details later, if they survived. We're under light. We won't make it to the heart of gold in time. Yes, you will, said Cora. I've seen you guys do this before, in the reality I raised. If you evacuate the dorms and the outer labs, you'll be able to downsize the shields and interlock the engines so that the impulse engine will lend power to the overlight. That's the most absurd plan I've ever heard of. It will mutilate the ship, said Jane. It's your plan. And I've seen it work. Captains, appealed Cora, you have to decide. I can't do it alone. The nebula is your best option. You will lose pieces of the compass, but no one else dies today. Jane hesitated for a split second. Trisha, plot a course for the heart of gold, she said determinately, unbuckling her seatbelt and leaping up. Trisha looked at Tam, silently asking for permission. The captain of the Valiant rose from his chair as well. I realize it's an awful plan, but it's the only one we have, said Jane. You don't have to come with me. This plan is completely and utterly insane and will get us killed, said Tam. Of course, I'll come with you. We're a team. Trisha, you heard the captain, step on it. Aye, captain. Jane and Tam ran down the hallway, and Tam took out his communicator. Evacuate the outer sectors now. He ordered over the comm. Anyone in a dorm or lab in the next two minutes will be burned to a crisp, and, no, I don't care what happens to your one pair of boots. Engine room, called Jane. I hope you're alive because we're going to need you. Put me on the local speaker. We don't have time to explain twice. Jane hastily outlined the plan. Roger that. We're on it, said Becca. Greg, any objections? Jane questioned. I object to being here, choosing between dying now or dying later, and not on a beach sipping coconut water, but we can discuss that another time. He said through his teeth, sounding like he was pushing on something. Outer wings evacuated, Captain. The head of security informed Tam. Prepare for turbulence. Tam's voice came over the speakers. Time to rock and roll, Greg, said Jane. This isn't going to be pretty, he said. Hold on. Flashback. The story of how Jane and Tam met. Part 4. Captain, something is wrong, Trisha said over the speaker, her voice shaking. I'm not. I'm not picking up planetary communication. Trisha displayed the image on one of the monitors, and for a second, Jane opened her mouth to ask what she meant and then closed it, speechless. She couldn't be seen correctly. She felt a sudden need to wipe her glasses. Great pioneers, she heard Eerie whisper beside her. No. That's not possible. There was something in space, just before where the star system should have been. It was destroying everything that dared to come close, tearing apart entire ships with some kind of energy. The space-bound colony, concentrated largely on the nearest space station, was burning in a fire without oxygen. Around it, debris of space-bound ships piled in clusters. Stray ships shot down under alien fire, trapped. The surface of the human planet, knocked from its orbit, cooled in a silent scream under a disaster-colored sky. Contact Captain Wright, said Jane. He's already hailing us, said Trisha. Drop the anchor, said Tam his tense face appearing in one corner of the screen, 
What are you going to do? asked Jane. What do you think I am going to do? He shouted. This is a ship with military capability, I'm going to rescue my compatriots. Jane thought quickly, her eyes widening as she came to her conclusion. No, she said. What? He replied, his face red, confused, and angry. This was not an accident. We're lucky we haven't been noticed yet. There are more species here than I can count by looking. If we stay, we will be killed, she said quickly. Then we died defending our colonies, persisted Tam. Our colonies died before we did, shouted Jane. Soon the vultures will start coming and if we don't get out of here soon we will be just another carcass. We can still save our crews, but you have to give the order. On his ship, Tam gritted his teeth and clung to the console, his non-mechanical hand shaking. His crew looked at him, not knowing what to do. Tam? Becca questioned, her hand resting reassuringly on her captain's. Captain, a ship, cried Ida. A quake swept through the Valiant before she could finish her sentence, sending half the crew flying like bowling pins. Becca landed with a thud on a railing and didn't get up. Becca. Ida shouted, and then, remembering her situation, said, Tam, the shields are failing. Get us out of here, Ida, he said. Ida punched a few buttons on the console and received a shock back, she abruptly took back her hand. The ship started to move, but there was no one at the helm. Captain, they're in trouble, said Trisha, her fingers working desperately on the console. Their ship is damaged and they seem to be losing steering control. Jane searched her mind, her fingers digging into her hair, pulling it out of its prison in a bun. Erie knelt in front of her and took her hands. Stay calm. You already have the solution. Jane was seized with a tranquility that was not her own, as if, for an instant, she could be sure that everything would turn out all right. Captain, she called over the calm. We can transfer the Valiant's navigation system to the compass, but you'll have to trust me. Your systems are damaged but your engines are in one piece. Do what you have to do, replied Tam resignedly, disappearing from the panel. Greg, we need a miracle. She said over the calm, explaining the situation as quickly as she could. I'll do my best, Captain. If I survive, you owe me one. Tell the Valiant to shut down their navigation panels. The ship slid through space, jerking and aimless, clinging to each other for dear life. Tam, how is your ship holding up? Eerie asked, his forehead furrowed in concern. Tam answered him with a curse word. Jane, they are going to need medical attention. Eerie remarked. Trisha. Are we being followed? She asked. No, she said. That, at least. Are there more interesting carcasses to pick clean? Jane grumbled softly. The ships began to lose speed. I'm in control, noted Trisha. We are in no condition to treat the crew here, said Tam, reappearing. My ship is slowly being torn apart. Stop so we can transfer the wounded to your ship. Trisha peeked over her shoulder and Jane nodded. The ship slowed gently until they finally stopped. We can never go back, not even to have a look, Jane said to Tam as the last of the wounded was transferred to Compass via the small swarm of escape pods, Tam nodded. We're on our own, he said, with a wistful pause. My ship will need repairs, and my chief engineer is unconscious. Looks like we're going to need to extend our partnership, said Jane. I'll have Greg take a look. Make no mistake. Sky, warned Tam. Just because you got the ship in better condition doesn't mean I'll let you run mine. Don't forget that I have the weapons and the engine. And I have the doctors and equipment, she redirected, defensively. Neither of us will get very far alone. Things are about to get really bad and we won't do our crews any favors if we start fighting. We're a team now. She reached out and placed her hands on Tam's arms in a firm, comforting grip. Tam, confused for a moment, reluctantly returned the gesture. We are a team now. He agreed. Present time As the captains entered the medical ward, Cora was waiting among the droids and incoming wounded, looking impatient. Tam said, I'm trying to understand why you haven't taken off yet. I told you I was waiting for your decision, Cora stubbornly replied. Let's get on with it. Jane raised her eyebrows and said, You know the engine won't have enough power once we get to the nebula, so... Cora shrugged. Even if it doesn't, where else are you going? Every species here knows where you'll be this time. They'll keep an eye on the sector for the next few hours. 
The best option is to wait for the dust to settle in the nebula, so they think you're dead. Well, you said we would need your help. Tam reminded her. We need your help. What's the plan? We only have a few hours. Cora held up her box. You only have a few hours. The battery is almost dead, but it's still enough to get me away. She explained. It works like a time machine, more or less, so I can buy you some time. I'll go, and when I get back, I'll bring equipment to build a better engine that can power the shields. It will seem to you that I was gone and back in an instant. Jane frowned. I'm not going to pretend that I understand very well what you just said. If we let you go, how do we know you'll come back? You're just going to have to trust me, Cora said. Tam and Jane looked at each other. I don't think we have a choice now. I hope you know what you're doing. Tam conceded. So do I. Cora agreed. Don't be long, Jane pleaded. Our crew depends on you. Cora nodded and, with trembling hands, turned on her machine. In the middle of the infirmary, interdimensional tear appeared, invisible and silent, and the captains of the compass watched in amazement as the girl they had pinned their hopes on disappeared through it, casting one last, shaky, unsure glance back. They hoped that their trust would not be wasted. Thank you for listening.